Good evening and welcome to the Cornell Fine Arts Museum. I am Anna Heller, the Bruce A. Beale Director of the Museum, and it is my pleasure to welcome you tonight for a very special lecture. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I want to acknowledge the Thomas P. Johnson Scholarship Fund here at, the, uh, at Rollins. Um, the, they uh, generously sponsored tonight's lecture, as they do most of our lectures here at the museum. And I would also like to acknowledge Professor Rachel Simmons from our art department, who brought the artist John Hitchcock to us, introduced him to the museum, and facilitated the installation that I hope you have all had a chance to see across the hall. Um, John Hitchcock is an artist and uh, a professor, an associate professor uh, and graduate chair at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, where he's been since 2001 and where he teaches screen printing, relief cut, and installation art. But he's also a very busy um, and active artist uh, who has done residencies in uh, New Zealand, Belgium, and China, among other places, and has participated in, has had actually solo exhibitions in England um, and Argentina, in addition to over 30, that's three zero, solo exhibitions in this country. Um, and I've sort of lost track of the uh, group exhibitions that he's been in. His CV is 47 pages long. So um, I, I say I'm not going to go through all of them, but I say we're very lucky to have him here tonight, um, that he could spare the time to come not only tonight to lecture for all of us, but he will be back in March, I believe, working with some of Rachel's students. So we are very fortunate that he's dedicated so much time and involvement with the Rollins community. His work is represented in many collections, both in this country and abroad, among them the uh, Spencer Museum in Lawrence, Kansas, Cornell University, the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, the University of Texas at Austin, the Library of Congress. And um, I hope you've all had a chance to go see the installation in our used gallery. Um, I have taken this, this habit of going across the hall after I spent some time in the quiet and calm of the Matisse exhibit, and then I go across the hall and, and John's installation just kind of jolts me back into, into reality. So the, the, the one word that I think to me best describes that installation is immersive. It, it really forces you to take it in as a whole, not as distinct and separate works of art within a space, but as the space with the works in it and immersive in a very thoughtful way. So I think we're very lucky tonight to have the artist himself who can talk about the installation and, and how he conceived it and what it means to him. And, and I'm sure we'll learn um, a few things. Uh, although the beauty of art is that the same artwork says different things to all of us. But uh, please help me welcome John Hitchcock. Uh, first, I want to thank all of you for coming, and I feel very, very lucky to actually be here, too, because this is a wonderful museum, a wonderful environment, and it's really amazing to be away from um, zero and 14 below weather. Um, it's nice here. I want to also thank um, uh, uh, Professor uh, Rachel Simmons for inviting me here, and Anna Heller, the director, and Sandy Todd, and Amy Galpin, too, for all the wonderful um, work that they've done that went into this catalog, the exhibition, the upcoming workshop. And I'm super excited to work with the students coming back because that's the energy. I mean, that's, that's why we're here. That's why what this is about, about education and, and being educated and learning and such. Um, one of the best ways that I can talk about the installation possibly is to talk about my background, where I'm from. Am I too loud or is this just right? Or you guys can hear me okay? Okay. So one of the things for me is to talk about what formulates my thinking and the process of making and how that thing happened in the other room. So I grew up on Comanche tribal lands uh, located among the Wichita Mountains of Oklahoma and a place called Medicine Park. And the Wichita Mountains are the oldest mountain 
um, range in the continental United States. And um, I was told that they were also the only mountain range running east and west. And I said that to a class at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe a couple weeks ago. And this young student said, no, I'm from Montana in our tribal lands. And she went off on me and was like, <laughs> no, we have lands. We have a mountain range that runs east and west, too. And I was like, OK, so we've got two of them now. So I <laughs> have to clarify that. So the Wichita Mountains Wildlife Refuge was established in 1901. And the refuge provides a habitat for large native grazing animals, such as the North American bison, elk, deer, and later longhorn cattle. I grew up on Highway 49, Highway 49, which runs east and west. And it splits up between Fort Sill, the military base, and various tribal lands along the way. And it runs to the Wichita Mountains. And located in the Wichita Mountains is this place called the Holy City. So basically a recreation of what Israel looked like during biblical times. In the sites, and it's the site of the nation's longest running Easter Passion play called the Prince of Peace. So for me, as a kid, we'd go to the Holy City, and I thought, wow, this is where Jesus lived. <laughs> I'm like, this is wow. Holy City. Then across the street, in contrast, I lived across from the United States military base, Fort Sill. So it's one of the largest field artillery installations in the Western United States. And Fort Sill, um, historically, was an army post that was established in the 19th century Indian war, as an Indian war fort. And it served as an internment camp for many indigenous leaders, such as Geronimo of the Apache people, St. Thide of the Kiowa people, and Quanah Parker of the Comanche. And my grandfather is a direct descendant of St. Thide. So on that side of the family, we learned a lot about the history of the mountains, the location, and Fort Sill it itself. He also worked on helicopters and tanks at Fort Sill. I'm going to start my timer so I don't talk too long. Or over time. OK. So the area is defined by the KCA, the Kiowa, Comanche, and Apaches, also known um, for these beautiful helicopters that patrol the world. It's like I said, Oklahoma State Highway 49 separates, separates my family's land from Fort Sill. So this, is, this area is really important to me because of uh, its influence and its history. I would see helicopters buzzing around at night, tanks driving by noisily, soldiers preparing for battle. Um, so both of these communities are major, major influences about the way I think, the way, the way I approach my art making. Um, then as a kid, again, I remember seeing the Vietnam War on TV in the 70s. And I thought, wow, I was confused. To me, this was happening right outside the door, right across the street on the other side of Highway 49. You'd hear the tanks rumbling the house. So I was a very confused child. I love this. Help preserve our heritage. Do not climb on the weapons. <laughs> Yay, America. So I come from a biracial family. Um, my mother's side, like I said, is Kiowa and also Comanche from, o from Oklahoma. And my father's side, his tribal affiliation is German and Northern European descent from <laughs> Holland, Michigan. So I feel as an intercultural hybrid in this ever increasing multicultural global perspective world, it's really important to look at the complexities of that, look at community, and look at who we are and what point we're at and where we're we going and where we're moving forward. Um, these are actually my grandmother's beadworks, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. I actually learned how to draw from my grandmother making um, designs and patterns for her beadworks. And so that was my introduction to drawing as a little kid. I would actually um, make these little um, geometric forms and shapes, which became these, these pieces that she would bead and then attach to regalia, which is dance regalia. And this was done as a child, but later, most recently as an adult, I've reapproached that drawing again and also using color in the work, which you'll see later on. One of the important components of, of um, the place I grew up was interaction and the being immersed, 
being around a event, like a tribal event, a powwow, American Indian gathering. You've got people speaking different languages. You have tribal communities coming together, together to eat various types of food, sharing language, song, dance, spiritual beliefs, stories. And so that was like a huge part of thinking. And there was this huge powwow that's every year that's called the American Indian Exposition, the Indian Fair in Indiarco, Oklahoma. And as a kid, they would have this circus type event going on with, with um, um, various types of gaming going on, a carnival event. Then you'd have an arena where there was actual powwow and ceremonial event going on. So they were side by side. Again, confused child, like, what does this mean? What is this all about? So thinking in terms of this participatory act where you play at a carnival game and the idea of gaming that happens within the powwow, things that happen at ceremonial that also references gaming, so I started to create these installation pieces where you had to throw a Nerf ball at these chickens, this whole wall full of chickens, 50 chickens, and then you get to receive a little prize. And the images I was using at the time were these um, animals, uh, beef, pork, and a chicken, uh, chicken, cow, pig. And these are food items that are distributed by the United States Department of Agriculture um, to welfare programs, third world countries, tribal lands, and how many people went through K through 12 public school? Anybody in here? A couple? A few people, yes. <laughs> then you've eaten this food. <laughs> We've all taken its nourishment. Uh, so I changed the title Frozen Ground Beef to Frozen Ground Fear. Um, also a few other things in there, inspected, U.S. inspected and passed by the Department of Agriculture, established in 1492. Just a little bit of, little, little bit of joking involved too. 16 ounces equals one pound. So using the appropriated imagery, but also thinking in terms of interactive, interactivity. At powwows, they'll lay a blanket down and they'll give away money and sometimes food and put it on the blanket for somebody who's traveled a long ways. Just as any kind of culture, when you travel somewhere, you go somewhere, there's gifts to exchange, or you do something for somebody, you get paid for it, or there's some kind of exchange. So taking that in mind and using that kind of um, bringing to people together of all ages, from young people to adults to elders and respected different, different age groups. Um, I wanted to have this so that you played the game and then you would get these little components or little screen printed objects that you could take home with you. This one is called the Peacemaker and it, it was influenced by the Colt 45 Peacemaker. Uh, the Peacemaker was the first multi-revolver six-shooter, and it was originally invented to kill Comanches, which is my mother's side of the family. So basically, the first weapon of mass destruction. And so I cut a 1,000 of these, screen printed them, and then participants were to hoop the bottle, and you got to take the little gun home with you. And so it's like psychological on one end. You, I want to get my political message in your pocket. It's fun. It's interactive. And... And the actual gun itself was from a little plastic toy gun that I got in a vending machine outside of a Mexican restaurant, restaurant in Lubbock, Texas. Little interactivity. My brother-in-law is actually here tonight. And this is him. This was a show in New York. Sister. So that was a show that happened in New York. This one was in, um, on the border of uh, Nuevo Laredo and Laredo, Texas. And this was really exciting to do the one in Texas. And, and the, I mean, it's exciting to do an exhibition anywhere, but especially on the border, because most of the students that I was working with when I did the installation all 
were moving back and forth between Mexico and Texas, so they were border crossing daily to go to school. Their grandparents lived on one side, their parents lived on the other side, and so that crossing of the border was an everyday occurrence for many years. 2001, 9-11 happens, shifts, changes everything. So it really made me think to work with these young people because they were, for me, the territory zone wasn't, didn't exist because for them, that was just crossing the street. It wasn't a big deal for the community. Uh, this is in Darmstadt, Germany. And it's uh, signage, again, the chicken, cow, pig, beef, pork, chicken. Um, looking at targets, like who's targeting who. Uh, if the government's targeting a certain group of people, say, I'm on a committee at the university and we're targeting certain groups of people too for hiring purposes or for uh, purposes of recruitment of students. It was just asking those questions of what does a target mean and when you're targeted and you've been targeted. And so what's the dynamics of that and the possibility and the potential, the positive as well as the negatives and just asking those questions and thinking about it in terms of artwork. And these are out, actually outside of my uh, grandparents' um, land on, at, at, well, my sister's land now, yeah. My, it, so these are signs that are facing Fort Sill and they're facing the military base. And these are in Darmstadt, Germany, in front of Fort Lincoln, I think it's called, which it's, uh, there's a national forest there and they're right next to the military base. So the positioning of them are at the same, both up at the same time and in two places that are very politicized. And one of them got stolen, so I was very excited in Germany. <laughs> and then the big one, the pig got shot, so. That was exciting. It's like if you do public art and nothing happens, and then you feel like there's no you know, movement or success with it. But when then I was telling the story about these pieces at Quartz Mountain, Oklahoma, and these are in Oklahoma on Highway 49. A lady came up to me in the audience and she said, "I know who shot your pig." <laughs> I won't divulge anymore, but. It was a military personnel because he was on the Fort Sill side, so that was kind of exciting. Uh, this is when we reach 87 billion stop, uh, an interactive installation asking uh, back at that time in 2004, before that, when we invaded Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, what does 87 billion dollars look like? And how do we see the potential of the multiple? And also, how can I, as an artist, an educator and a printmaker use the multiple in a public space to ask questions about politics because printmaking is a driving force in politics and it, it has a very political mo uh, motivation behind uh, why you would use the multiple for propaganda or for media purposes. So the plan was to reach 87 billion. <clears throat> I had a couple um, people come up that were in Texas. This was in Denton, Texas, University of North Texas, Denton. And a, a friend, a colleague, John Hancock, um, brought in another, a student of his, Joseph Velasquez, who runs a press called Drive-By Press. This was my first meeting of Joseph, and they come up to help do this project. And we printed, we were trying to reach 87 billion little tick marks, the little one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. So we started at nine o'clock in the morning, and at about five or six o'clock in the afternoon, we ran out of ink. And there's no way we would have ever reached 87 billion. But logically, you know, and as a project, it's like, let's try this. Yeah, let's have fun, make prints. And then talk about printmaking. It was in a very populated area, so people were walking by. They'd come in and 
visit with us and we talk with them and talk about printmaking and have them pull the squeegee too so they were introduced to it. And uh, the a student estimated that if we were to actually reach 87 billion, we would have to pull, she sat down and did the math. We would have to pull the squeegee, which takes about 30 seconds to a minute, 30 seconds to a minute per pull, that we would have to do it under 30 seconds continuously for 24 hours, seven days straight. And we would have reached the 87 billion, estimated on that time. So I was excited. I was like, I'm going to do this again. This one's called More Than a Thousand. And it was, <laughs> why not? Lower the bar. Yeah, let's make it, let's, let's really uh, not succeed. Um, at the time, I was a little uh, hurt, actually. Uh, and so because, uh, well, it was election time, and um, Mr. Bush was reelected. And during that time, um, it was reported that more than a thousand soldiers had soldiers had been killed in the war in, in Afghanistan and Iraq, but I was keeping count on that body count and on there's a place called Body Count online and there was all these different sources and I was looking at the various sources of how many Iraqi uh, soldiers, uh, other soldiers that were also. Uh, people that were there for private sector jobs, how many of those people have passed away, and so there was not a count for that. And so just thinking again, what's that thousand mean? And so taking a little toy soldier and repeat printing it all day, and this was at McAllister College in um, St. Paul, Minnesota. <laughs> and while we were doing it, I didn't know this, but it, we ac it accidentally fell on the day that it was bring uh, the high school students to, to the school to see the school to visit. So it, it kind of was a, a harsh one because we were doing this political activity and there were people who def, definitely didn't agree with the issues and, and it, was, it was a good conversation though again happened. And the high schoolers got to pull squeegees and here we are. We started in the morning and we did the same thing. We started at nine o'clock and that's me in the corner with the really short hair. And, uh, and we started printing at 9, and then by 3, I think, we actually ran out of ink. So, and we had backup. And we, when we ran out, we were at 988, I think. So, and we continued, and we actually finished it. And we covered the whole space. So one of the other things is collaboration. So these projects lead to collaborative efforts. Um, while there, a colleague, uh, Keith Christensen, he actually lives in St. Paul, too, him and I discussed doing this other project, which ended up being this thing called Moving Targets, and it was in Berlin, Germany, and Poznan, Poland. There's this big print conference called Impact, and we put in a proposal to do a piece about targeting again. Who's your target? Who's targeting you? And we invited 100 artists from all over the world and asked if they would uh, respond to that, qu that simple question, who's your target and who's targeting you, and what does a target mean? Respond by a visual print. Um, we received 80, uh, almost 100. We didn't receive all of the prints. We hung them in the, uh, Berlin at the university, and we also um, hung them in, uh, um, in, in um, um, Poznan, Poland. And the bigger part of it was to we proposed to do this on the train between Berlin and Poznan, but the organizers never got permission. So we were like, well, let's do it anyway. So we did it. So we were going to exhibit them in this train. And what we did is we organized all the little prints, put them on a clothesline in little plastic sheets, synchronized watches, met in one of the, the train carts, and put all the prints together, and we had four artists helping us, two of them, one from Berlin and the other one from Poznan. They could speak the language fluently, and we had little postcards we were handing out, and there were five or six train cars, over 800, 900 people in these cars, jumped out of our little cart and proceeded to carry these prints. And we had a little display of these political prints walking up and down. You can see people eating the food cart. And we're just kind of carrying our little prints along the way. And, and um, at one point between Germany and Poland, they stopped the train. And that's why my, I look real geeky there with my um, passport hanging out. 
that they wanted to see our passports as they cross over from one country to the, to the next. And we were really worried because it was an armed guard, and I thought he was going to shut us down or something. But he was very nice, and he asked, what's this about? What's your politics? What, what are you? He was like critiquing me. And I'm like, it was nice to get a critique. And then he just finally said, carry on with the Kunst. And we just walked along. So this is Barb Matson, a printmaker at Rutgers, that was along with us. And one of my favorite ones is this one. It says, um, I'm doing it my way. What are you doing? Making fine art prints. So that's Bush, the Pope, and bin Laden. Um, that led to another opportunity. opportunity be, a curator was on the train. Um, she runs a place called uh, Proyecto Ese in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And she invited me to do something with her to co-collaborate. But her conditions were that she wanted um, half of the artists will do 100 artists. Of the 100, um, 30 of them had to be under 30. And then the other 20 have to be established artists in both, in both um, areas, in South America and North America. So what we did, again, we, we asked the artist, what's your target? And I assembled all the images. They sent them to me via the internet. And then I arranged them on these banners and had them digitally printed in Argentina. And the young artists in Argentina um, came out, and they actually worked with me during the week. And we made prints. And, and we did this display. And the display was at the local the train center. And in Argentina, they're very used to political activity and these types of events happening. So it was kind of exciting to have people come up and say the same thing, like, what are, what are you guys doing here? What's, oh, an art show. It's exciting. So they were, they were excited to see the art. And they didn't see it as a political activity, even though all the works were about politics. They thought we were some kind of religious group because of the big cross. So. And one of the things that happened from that is we rode the train from, we, we marched from Proyecto Ese 15 blocks to the train station, rode the train about two miles, and the train ride ended at this litho workshop, a lithographic workshop, and all the young artists got to be introduced to lithography. And so they helped print a print, and we drew on stones, and again, that teaching activity of lithography and printmaking and merging them. And so public pieces have been important to, to my making. And so this was one in um, Tennessee, uh, University of Tennessee, Knoxville, mig migration re relocation. And it's about people being forcibly removed. And growing up in Oklahoma and knowing that that's the place where so many indigenous people live because they've been removed from other places and forced to live there, from the Cherokee removal from the east to the northern tribes, moving them down. Now living in the north, it's, it's really interesting to hear voices from the north, like wh where they come from, versus being in Oklahoma and knowing their displacement. And so those, those, those places of entry. So this piece is about that, people forcibly removed and relocated. Again, working with the students to do this. I'm going to talk a little bit about printmaking. Um, I think I'm talking about printmaking quite a bit. You could print on anybody or anything or any. I love screen printing because you can print the multiples and what, what, uh, what happens with it. This was at an event um, at the Madison Library called Stacked. And we actually, with a group of, of past grad students and current and other community members, and actually the master printer from Tandem Press, Andy Rubin's in there too. And, we have this portable screen print unit. And so the portability of, of printmaking, especially screen printing, like you can do this anywhere. Um, this was another project that Emily Arthur, who's here as well today, tonight, um, we did a big project in um, 516 Arts in New Mexico. And one of my undergrad, past undergrad students, in, uh, developed this bike, by, it's a bike company called Playdate Bikes, uh, Wes Olfig, and this is one of his tricked out bikes and we made this incredible bike cart. There's Emily printing at a farmer's market. And so we put images in the screen, and we're printing. And then people can come up and put their t-shirt down. And we were giving prints away. 
So that was a big component of it. I do a lot of uh, printing on stickers and movable parts that they can be reconfigured on, live print actions, I guess. And sometimes these are printed on magnets, so the magnets are removable. I switch from stickers to magnets because then it doesn't like clutter the environment and they're reusable. Um, large scale installations. So this started to happen. These big animal imagery is again influenced by the first part of the talk about the Wichita Mountains and the animals that are located there. It's, so I recycle and reuse these. The other big part of, of um, filling a room like that, I want to do things that are that's very portable. So that whole show probably was it arrived in a tube and a box. There's usually two boxes, a couple tubes, and that's it. In some cases, I could take two tubes on an airplane and be able to fill a space like that because everything's on components that are easily reusable. And this is um, using paper, wood, and felt combined. So they become like emblems too, kind of symbolic emblems. And growing up with, uh, my father was in the military, he was, he was actually ended up in Lawton Fort Sill because of uh, the Korean War. And my grandfather worked at Fort Sill, my cousin Eddie Nakwadi worked there too. Several uh, family members have worked at Fort Sill. And going on that base, I would cross through Fort Sill to go to Cameron University where I went to undergraduate. All those emblems, and I also played in death metal rock bands in the 90s. And all the people we played for were uh, military. So I would end up driving them home after the gig because I was the straight one because I was playing all night and then take the, the military personnel home. But those emblems and the way that the emblems are on the jackets and the clothing, I wanted to start to make these animals reference that. And many of the emblems that are used too, the military um, logos reference native identities, native tribes. Um, and so reflecting on that too. And the circular scattered effect is kind of um, thinking in terms of, of mandalas and shapes and patterns. And then you saw the beadwork earlier, my grandmother's beadwork. Those are also pattern forms. And so I create the, the, the work in a pattern-like shape. And I also like clusters because the cluster is in reference to how people were removed and put onto reservations, broken apart from families, put into boarding schools, just as much as these animals were put onto a wildlife reservation, removed from their original habitat, and put into a place. And so growing up sandwiched between military base, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and, the, which, and tribal lands, and thinking about that. Never really thought about it seriously until leaving and then reflecting back and going back to it. Um, more happy stuff to talk about. The owl. Uh, the owl is a symbolic relationship to death. Yay. <laughs> but also transition and transferal. And in my growing up, my grandfather would tell us stories. And the storytelling in a lot of this work, um, grandpa, would, grandpa would talk about the messenger of death. And the messenger for Kiowa people is the owl. And if you hear an owl outside of your house, particularly a screech owl, that means the oldest member of your family is going to pass away. And with that, means knowledge passes with them. So it's not that it's a bad thing, it just means it's a transition. And so I grew up pretty freaked out because they would tell me these stories. And I um, avoided, I went to my high school, it was called the Elgin Owls. And, yeah, and, it's, and I ended up designing the logo for the football team, which had a big owl with the crossbones on it, and I was excited about that, but that was like the only time I ever drew an owl. And as an adult, I've always avoided it, just taboos. And so recently, I started to re-investigate um, the, the owl itself, and, and, I was wor and I've been working with um, young people at community centers, and we've been screen printing large owls, like the owl shapes that are in the installation, and putting those outside of buildings at sort of ward off badness, or also the, the whole idea of trans, trans, transition. And so we would work with these kids and ask them to draw owls, and what's their position on what owl means. And the project was called Owler. 
And I won't, t should I tell him what it was called before Aller? All right, I won't. No, it's bad. It was called Prowler. It was another project and then it turned into Aller because Prowler's not a good thing to have when you're working with kids. It's a bad, badness, badness. So we turned it to Aller. Um, I recently have lost a lot of family members in the past five years, my mother, my father, my grandparents, my cousin, my aunt. And so exploring the mythology of the owl and the mythology of the transition to another place and thinking about death and thinking about that transition has kind of helped me as an artist get back to drawing and thinking and thinking in terms of what got me into this to begin with is drawing. I was just talking with Rachel's student here. We had a little book, uh, sketchbook off a second ago. And it was nice, because we had this little intimate moment. She was showing me, she had her sketchbook, and I'm like, look at this one. And she's showing me her sketchbook. And we're kind of going back and forth on our sketchbooks. And it's like this has a, a very, very uh, important place, I think, as creative people. And she said, this is a very intimate moment. And it was, because it was a sharing moment of, us as artists, as communicators, and we were able to communicate in another language, a visual language that helps strengthen us as people. And I think that that's a powerful part of, of how we were able to, to change or shift the mindset. Uh, this is called Traces of the Plains. It's, it's a screen print on Naga Hide, and it was at the Rauschenberg Project Space in New York. And this is an ongoing exhibition that's currently at the North Dakota Museum in a show that uh, has traveled from New York, and it's also um, went to Spirit Lake, the Sioux Reservation. And it's, uh, Songs for Spirit Lake is the name of the exhibition. And we just had the opening in, in South Dakota this weekend. And so, what am I showing here? All right. They're moving their feet, but nobody's dancing. This was in 2007, another print action. This was a 24-hour situation where I invited the participants to print with me, create, make, establish everything within 24 hours. By the end of the 24th hour, we were having our opening. And so that was us in the space, making everything, and this was um, the finished product. And Dusty Herbig is the professor there um, at Syracuse, and so he worked with the, gathered his students. We also worked with the forest, industry and they have one of the largest um, I don't know if anybody knows about paper making they have a paper making um, what is the paper making thing called paper mill the beater like the Holland beater they have a beater that's the size of this room that makes giant vats of paper like it's huge so it, so they donated all the paper for this project it was all made from their forest industry which was exciting uh, another one at uh, College Park, uh, University of Maryland, uh, Collateral Consumption. I think there's some video here. very interesting that song to me because it reminds me of um, being a, a teenager or a 20 year old and playing heavy metal or death rock at uh, these venues in Oklahoma. There's a band called Pantera and we used to play with them, open up for them quite a bit. And so being involved with that scene at a young age and that music and the violence of it but on the other end, that's what the military personnel wanted to hear. And so that song itself, Rain and Blood, it's about the idea of taking over and controlling and controlling a society or controlling people and destroying everything without any, without any um, guilt or cause or, or guilt from it. And so taking that, that um, 
the sound of it and using it in a video and using the military weaponry, it was important to me to combine that. And very strangely, I will go to it. Why not? I just got a text from someone. I'm going to try this out. And I was uh, on a flight here. Let's go to Facebook. And when I was on my way here, I got a text from somebody. And let's go to my page here. And someone had proposed to someone in front of my installation because they were inspired because of the rain and blood <laughs> song. See if I can find it. There it is. So there it is proposing in my work installation. <laughs> And so I get this text from, uh, via Facebook from the woman who was proposed to saying, uh, we were going to Santa Fe to see the Goya show, Disasters of War. Yay, happy stuff. We're into printmaking. She's, a, she's working to be a master printer at Tamarin. And they love my work. And they, they heard I was in a show. They went to go see it. And Rain and Blood was playing. And they were looking at my work. And the romantic moment just hit. <laughs> and bam! He proposed. And she contacts me, and I'm like, this is awesome. I don't know who you are. This is awesome. And so and she asked if she could, like, purchase prints. And I said, send me your address. I'll send you a stack of prints, like, for your engagement. That is so awesome. That's crazy. In a good way. I'm glad Slayer can do that still. Now, if I can get back to my talk. Oh, it's all out of whack. It's okay. We're good. <laughs> Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, this was the installation in Argentina. And I'm just going to kind of run through th a few th more things, and we'll cut, call it and ask, uh, do some questions. Um, planning. Like, a lot of planning goes in, into the installations. And so I'll do some of my planning um, with sketches on the computer. But now I pretty much kind of sketch it in the sketchbook and then go in and just build it on site. This was the sketch for this piece. Um, this was at a, the Forest Art Project. We did, I showed an earlier Forest Art Project in Germany, in Darmstadt. This is actually in Manaqua, in north woods of, um, of Wisconsin. And it was called Invasive, a Native Invasive. So I was thinking about the native animals that might have lived where we have created this invasive space in a beautiful um, park, or actually a beautiful forest, and replanting, or in a sense, replacing the animals along the trail with the walkways. And big shift here. OK, here we go. <laughs> so I, uh, in 2009, I had a, was diagnosed with a pituitary tumor. So pituitary tumor, the size of a lime in the middle of my skull, pressing on my optic nerve, causing me to go blind in both of my eyes. Yeah. So what do you do with that? I'm like, OK, geez. And so I'm going MRI, I got the MRI, you got the tumor shape, you've got sitting in that machine. And, and the doctors, um, they operate. I, I do a, a brain surgery. They go through my nose, and they cut the tumor in half. So now it's the size of the lime that's going to be on the mixed drink I'm going to drink later tonight. So it's about the size of that. It's like little. But that's still huge for a pituitary tumor. One in five people have one. It's about 10 in here, 12. However, most of them are not the size of mine. So I took the big hit for you out there. Usually they're, they're like the size of your um, pinky, like the tip of your pinky, because the pituitary tumor gland is, a pituitary gland is the size of a pea, and the tumors normally are just a little bit bigger, you know, they bulge out. Mine was insane. So that caused me to reinvest into that personal space, drawing, the intimacy of drawing, and what does it mean to be a, a, a maker, a drawer? Because I'm like, I'm going to go blind. I'm going to draw. So I started drawing like crazy. I returned to color. I used to do color a lot as a little kid. 
and because of my grandmother's beadworking. And so I got all of my grandmother's beadwork out, put it around in my studio space. And I, when she passed away, I was fortunate that I received a lot of her beadwork and I, to keep and um, so to archive. And so I have it all out and it was inspiring to, to be around it and to witness that and to live with it and to think about it. And then at the same time, I, let's just go to Facebook and do it for real since we were there. I ended up posting every day on Facebook what I call the drawing a day. And I started just before the actual surgery and I would post a drawing. I would sit every morning, I would actually draw maybe 30 minutes worth of drawings and then it turned into an hour's worth. The next, I was fortunate, I'm, I teach Monday through Wednesday and then Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, I have my art making research days. I would spend all day drawing and it ended up um, being this archive on Facebook and I'm actually taking these and going to make a little catalog with them. So these are some of the drawings. And I would post one every day, and I did this for one year straight. And it was a way for me to come up with imagery, but also to articulate what was going on with the progress of, of um, the tumor itself. And so these little animals become stand-ins for me at some point. And at some point, you just draw a cold beer. It was one of those days, or a forest, or a little bomb. So these become the little plans, again, for larger pieces. This is a weird little drawing, I don't know why. <laughs> Love that funky little drawing. And I, I um, would draw people I'd see on the bus in Madison, or just out and about. So it became a, another way of thinking. And it was really exciting to, to be able to explore the potential of drawing again. And so that led to larger pieces. And these larger works are studio space here. And so I started to take and reinvest into thinking about the composition and, and not doing the installation and the politicized aspect of the work started to shift and become more personal and very personal. There's actually my grandmother's beadwork, and you can see it as a pattern. Like here's the pattern right here, and that's uh, the actual beadwork. It's an unfinished piece of hers. That's in there. And this is two finished pieces. And these are fairly large, 30 by 44, large scale, mixed media. I call them unique prints because there's screen printing involved, there's paint markers, there's drawing back into it with various types of media. Uh, grandmother's beadwork, a hair, hair piece. And all of these are actually showing in uh, Santa Fe right now at the Museum of Contemporary Native Arts. And you, you saw a little sample of the, the proposal image. And I'm going to talk about maybe two more projects and then we'll cut it. So we're good. We, Emily and I were fortunate to go with a group of artists in um, 2011 to Venice, Italy to do an exhibition um, that was part of the Venice Biennale. And it was an initiative created by Nancy Marie Michelo, who has been working for over 15 years to create an indigenous perspective at the Venice Biennale and to sort of covertly do this by way of um, outside of the Biennale, sometimes inside of it. She's had actual, there's like five different ways of being a part of the Biennale when it happens, and, and we were doing it pretty much as a political statement. And one of the projects Emily and I did is we walked around Venice and we took small little screen prints and placed them throughout the city. Another part of it is the video that's here that you're seeing in the, uh, the gallery. The, we projected that on various parts of the city too at night. And then we had a, well, here's a little bit of the video. Here's a mile 
treated. So we would sit and basically project and then place prints in the daytime, our offerings. And in the museum, we would just accidentally drop some fancy prints on, which museum was this? The, what's the most famous museum in Venice? Academia. It's Academia. So right in the entryway in the hallway. And I don't have the picture. I, should, I wish I should put that up. It's, it's this um, couple, this family, and they're like, they see me drop the print, and then I'm walking off taking the picture, and they come up and they reach down and grab the print and take it. It's like, yes. Uh, here is the group, uh, John Hancock, um, Ryan O'Malley, uh, um, Nancy Marie Mythalo, and, and Emily Arthur and me. And also, we printed live. This was very exciting in Venice um, with all of the activity going on at the Biennale, but to have live printing. And the, student, the, the university is right down the street from where we were printing, so that was exciting to have the students come over. and. And I made a little the installation that I created in Santa Fe. Actually, is this from this piece, which we I put out on the in front of the gallery space. And then we had an actual exhibition proper in a school space. These are actually Emily Arthur's pieces, Ryan O'Malley, and Joseph Velasquez. And this is Ryan O'Malley went around Venice and went around and did wheat pasting too. So we did a whole wheat pasting component where he took his work as well as some of the artists that were participating in the exhibition and wheat pasted. And then that led to another round of doing it in just recently, last summer, right, 2013. We went to Venice again, and we had a whole other group of artists. Then we traveled the show back to 516 in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where Ryan O'Malley, Marin Begay, Here's Marwin on the left, Emily Arthur. Four of us collaborated to create this huge mural, which becomes basically the impetus at the beginning of how this piece came together here. Because working with them and learning like how we would build this piece, and this piece was all built in the gallery space. We spent four days on it, and we screen printed and made everything. Like you can see, we, we turned the, the gallery into there's the bicycle we put together. We turned the whole space into an actual studio. And by the end of the week, we had all kinds of fun arguments and excitement and intentions and collaborations. And then by the end, we had this beautiful show. And then we celebrated by screen printing out at the, the um, we did a print blitz, print blitz. So we hit the farmer's market. After staying up till six in the morning, we went nine, 10 o'clock farmer's market in July heat of Albuquerque. Ooh, it was hot. Here's Marwin. And uh, when the show ended, it was up for about three months. Um, here's the bicycle. We gave all these components away as a gift to audience members on the final day of the show. So we gifted away components of the installation for this piece. That's all I got. Thank you.